1996, there was a civil war. It was actually a war, Rwanda and Congo. Those guys were fighting, a lot of people died, over a million people died. February the 2nd, so to be exact, I uh, came here, I've never seen snow before in real life. So before I started speaking English, I was getting into a lot of fights because I, was, I wasn't able to defend myself verbally. Uh, I always wanted to be a videographer, I wanted, I wanted to be on camera, always. So my first ever phone in, 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 when I was uh, 14, I started a YouTube channel. That also got me bullied because I was the only person in my high school doing videos. And one video went viral and every single person knew about it in school. And if I did carry on, I'll be chilling with KSI and all those guys today. <laughs> <laughs> but... Hi there, welcome to the latest episode of Craig Houston Talks To. And in this episode, I have the pleasure of interviewing a young man with a great future and a very interesting past. A few months ago, Baraka invited me onto his show, The Baraka Show, as a guest to discuss one of my videos. He was interested in a video I put out about Hamza Yusuf. And we spoke before the, um, the show and we spent a lot of time after the show talking. And I learned that this boy, this young man, his story was fascinating. From humble beginnings to a YouTube channel reaching hundreds of thousands. And for a guy who spent, was conceived and born in a refugee camp in Tanzania due to his family having to flee Congo, he then spent the next 11 years of his life in the confines of a gated camp, waiting on someone somewhere to grant his family asylum as they had no chance of returning home and had nothing to return home to. It's a fascinating story and when you consider this guy's upbringing from, you know, from a refugee camp, to hear his feelings and opinions on the refugee situation just now. And that, the takeaway from this interview for me was his opinions on those who jump the queue, who are fake asylum seekers. And it sees his family, and many like them, left in concentration camps around the world for years longer than they should. As others selfishly jump the queue and leave these people in turmoil in tented villages across the world. So sit back, get a coffee, a carbonated drink or a tin of beer and enjoy just over an hour of Baraka's story. Yeah, so my journey, uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty like uh, up and down type of stuff, but I was born in a refugee camp. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the war in Congo, because uh, my parents are from Congo. But I was not born there because the war broke out in 1997 or 1996. It was a civil war. It was actually a war, Rwanda and Congo. Those guys were fighting, a lot of people died, over a million people died in that sort of uh, conflicts that happened. And my parents ran, obviously they ran into Tanzania, it was a refugee camp there. Mm -hmm. uh, then obviously I was born there. Uh, so my my childhood was more of like, it's a camp. There's not any sort of fun stuff like TVs. You, you, there was not any sort of, like in today's time, when I speak to my friends now, when they tell me their childhood, I'm like, whoa, wait, you had you had Xbox? I didn't know what that was. Because I was just running around, you know, we're probably like, I'm not sure if you've seen those pic those videos that goes out like online where young people are just walking around topless in, in like a third world country. That was kind of like me, yeah. you know, walking topless, barefoot, just minding my business, right? And um, so we looked into obviously trying to like uh my my parents wanted to get out of that refugee camp so they can provide better life for ourselves and themselves and obviously the, the family as well and uh luckily we came here in the uk i was on i got here in 2013 february the second so to be exact uh, i came here i've never seen snow before in real life so it was snowing back then, but now climate change is the biggest threat, so it doesn't snow anymore for some reason. <laughs> I don't know about that. But in 2013, it was snowing. Uh, so I'm trying to, I was trying to adapt into that. Bear in mind, I was uh, 11. 
so i'm just trying to get into all this i was in, trying to learn english that was tough by the way but i was there i was the one that learned english faster in my in my family because i was always curious to know what is happening i wanted to understand like what are these people saying it sounds fun this is too eloquent like i want to know what is this language so when we came here uh we joined a school I think I I was the last one to join a school because I meant to go into primary school, but my age was just like the time that I came here, there will be no point joining year six because I would have to, like the next few months, I would have to go in, into year seven. So what happened is they held me off from joining till year seven rather than joining just for a couple months. Did you get me? Yeah. So. So then I joined uh, school at year seven and trust me, the first year was brutal. <laughs> the first 12 months was brutal because I didn't know how to speak English. I was just like, uh, I was there, I was there existing, you know, nodding my head. And uh, if, if I, I can say yes and no, those are like, yes, no, okay. I think those are the things that you learn pretty quick. Yes, no, okay. Hi, how are you? Uh, anything else i didn't know so there was kind of a bit of like a little bullying going on but then that that, that is fine because in high school that happens that's normal high school obviously you bully each other and that went on for a bit until i started speaking english i was able to defend myself but then but then before before i started speaking english i was getting into a lot of fights because i was i wasn't able to defend myself verbally the only way i could defend myself is smacking him in the head or whatever he, he said and usually because in high school i don't know if they do it today in today's kid when high school there's a lot of people who instigate a lot somebody mm -hmm. might say a little thing but there'll be two boys there trying to gas it up meaning like oh he said he's gonna do this he's gonna do this and you feel like that guy has said something really bad but really and truly it wasn't that bad so that was working on me all the time and i got into a lot of fights then then I uh, learned English, went through the GCSE phase. I became a bit famous in my high school because uh, I always wanted to be a videographer. I wanted, I wanted to be on camera, always. So my first ever phone in, 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 when I was uh, 14, I started a YouTube channel. This is where I was doing, you know, the things that Jake, uh, you know, the thing that Jake Paul and KSI and all these things that they was doing, I wanted to do that. I wanted to go out there and record myself kicking the ball into the crossbar challenge. I wanted to do all that. I wanted to be on camera because I don't know. It's something about movies that catches me all the time. Like I like that, you know? So but that also got me bullied because I was the only person in my high school doing videos. And one video went viral and every single person knew about it in school. And what was your viral, what was your viral vid video, Baraka? It was uh, it was pictures of my <laughs> it was picture of my whole family, yeah. And so I got bullied hard on that video. Then I don't know for some reason I I just thought no no I'm not going through that again. So I just stopped. I'm assuming if I did carry on, I'll be chilling with KSI and all those guys too. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, obviously I, I didn't carry on, so I stopped. But I always wanted to be in the videos. I always wanted to be. But so I went through the GCSE phase, went into college, and as soon as I got into college, I was like, "Oh, I want to be into videos again." Then I started in 2019, and uh, it was pretty cool. I grew very fast because I was only I was naturally good at it. Uh, I think I got like a thousand subscribers within like less than a month opening it. Uh, it was pretty quick and fast in 2019. Then. <laughs> things changed uh life uh i got old well i got I turned 18 and obviously if you're living in a in in the i don't know if you're living in a foreign type of uh, family hold they always want you to contribute something it's either you're in school if you're not in school you have to contribute meaning you have to go work and help out rent and help out stuff in the house of course right i'm not sure if you uh if you're probably familiar with that too yeah. so i got part-time jobs and uh slowly and slowly i got into money i wanted to make money now i'm like damn i need money because if i can get money i can get a camera if i can get a camera i can get a laptop i can edit i can do proper videos so i wanted to do 
that but slowly and slowly it shifted me into wanting into wanting to do full-time work which obviously that's when you get more money so then the passion of filming kind of like you know it just went down and more of trying to get money up and i was in union this time covid hit and uh that's when everything changed everything really went bad because now we're at home the only thing i could do is is make videos i can't go to work because the work that i was doing back then was warehouse job because it was quick it was fine it was quick and it was high paying type of stuff you didn't need that much experience it was quick to get into so I, we, we i was not going to work we we're staying at home so i focused on on, on tiktok instead because most people was on tiktok during the covid time and i grew the tiktok from within three months i was on 100k plus uh, on uh, followers on tiktok so you could tell i had that thing within video i wanted to do these videos but i stopped doing youtube i i, I thought yeah tiktok is the one so i kept on going with that but then during covid i got introduced into this new guy uh because I, I i figured out this guy on youtube his name is called patrick bit david i don't know if you got if you've heard of him patrick bit david is a he, he runs a big channel on youtube called valuetainment and uh he, he, he used to be a salesperson i'm not sure if he still is he, he used to run a sales business for people hate people helping people php and uh the way he used to make his videos the way he used to tell his stories within the videos i just loved it and he, he had this uh this proudness of being an american and also an immigrant in in uh, in us from iran so uh, his story was similar to me he came in america when he was 11 i came in the uk when i was 11 he's passionate he's a businessman he's an entrepreneur he's doing all these cool stuff and he's telling the stories like i'm like wow he's getting kobe Bryant on the podcast everything i'm like oh what i want to do that yeah i want to do i just got excited so what i did i went to do exactly what he was doing i joined the sales organization it was a, a face-to-face organization so i stopped doing videos now I want to learn how to sell. I want to be a businessman. So I learned, uh, I joined a sales organization. We went through, uh, I learned all these uh, the way of talking, way to sell and stuff. Uh, then I left that company because the person who was running that company, I don't think it was good enough for me. Because it was, it was, it was too favoritism. He had a lot of favoritism to the, person, to the people who have been there for long new guys didn't really exist to him i wanted to be recognized i wanted to 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 be to learn from the guy at the very top but he didn't have time for small people like us i guess and his company was not that big so it's kind of weird that he didn't have time for new guys who probably would have run it for him better but then i left that company i joined another sales company this one's a door-to-door company and it was quite new it was, it was like seven people in there so i felt that i was like yes i can play a part here uh so i grew in that company i became a leader uh I became an account manager where you have uh, people that you're recruiting now when you're recruiting you're teaching people you're teaching exactly what you know and you're telling them how to sell how, and you t- telling them how to lead as well so then they can create their own people and then the office grows and this person wanted to go to london he wanted to move his his business in london and i'm from up north i love I, I love where i am from i have all the history here all my friends are here family everyone is here so i was like no nah, london is too busy for me i don't want to go that far i want to stay close home so he left now i have no company to work in so i was like okay Either I join another company or I can just uh, start my own, right? Isn't that what Patrick B. David is doing? So I started my own company and uh, I grew that. It was it was pretty sick the way we did it. Like uh, I got my sister in. She joined. I taught her, I taught her how to sell because I could trust her. She, you know, she I got her to learn how to sell, how to lead, how to recruit, how to do interviews, everything. And she was like me. So there was two of us now. She brought a friend in, so free. And then I got a couple of guys in and we started recruiting on Indeed and we grew that office to like 21 employees. Then we got an office. My first ever office deal, I got scammed. Uh, <laughs> it was really, it was really sad. The first time I went there, 
uh, uh, I found this office on Facebook. So, guys, if you're getting into business and you're looking for office space, don't look on Facebook. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> don't look on Facebook. Yeah. So this guy went to meet him. That nice lot office was like a big, big building. You can look down in Manchester town. It's nice, lovely office. I felt like uh, you know, I felt like the wolf, uh, the Wolf of Wall Street type of stuff. Oh. Sitting down, I'm down. The, the the town i'm like this is the office i want and the guy said oh yeah if you want this office you gotta leave your first month depo uh, your deposit on the first month rent and uh he, he, i guess he was too good at selling than me at that time so he sold me to it i left my first month deposit and my first month rent with him and he took a picture of my id and he told me come tomorrow and we'll print out all the stuff and we'll get your name signed and we'll give you the key tomorrow tomorrow i came the guy's never there and yeah, the, ever since then, <laughs> no money has ever came back. So I lost those, that money. Then, then I had to tell the team, hey, let's carry on. By the way, before we got an office, we was I had twenty one employees in the coffee shop. I still have videos of me giving impacts in a coffee shop like Starbucks. We had like so many people in Starbucks. Mm -hmm. yeah. To the point, Starbucks started charging me every time when we used that their space. We had to pay. Well, I had to buy everybody coffee, so that was a, a small expense, but coffee. I'm sure Starbucks didn't want to waste their space for one people just sitting there doing sales. <laughs> so you could tell I had the ambition to make it, right? Then we got an office, exciting. It was in Salford. It was nice, good office. And uh, things got excited again. We were selling. We were doing good. We had two clients. Uh, we were selling. It was door-to-door. -door. Uh, was non-profit was selling was doing non-profit and profit uh, organization so non obviously charities and uh, organization so it was pretty cool and uh, I was like okay how can I scale this because here's a guy Patrick B Davis is 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 out there doing all these stuff is making videos and everything and I was like ah so I've learned how to sell I've grown a team I got an office oh the last one's missing is putting the camera on again mm -hmm. so we got the camera on again i'm like yes but <laughs> that's the thing with business unless you got somebody as good or better than you to run it before you put yourself start promoting and stuff you lose it all you can't have it all at the same time either you have to grow one first to the point where you can take time off and do videos so time hit hard we couldn't make a. a, a, a we couldn't make enough to make rent some months. We couldn't make enough to like, I couldn't make enough to like make sure the staff are paid up and everything. So they start disappearing. The ones who were not fully, fully interested, the one that was just there for a paycheck, they start disappearing. The ones that who believed in the dream and believed what well, I can make it there. They stayed. Then later on, they realized, Oh, you know, it's better to make more money than staying here with this guy. As as much as I like him, <laughs> I still gotta pay the rent. So they left, and uh, and only one three people stayed. It was me, uh, my sister, and my and the, uh, my girlfriend today. So we were there struggling, and I was I was here to make a decision: either I give away the office because it's the only thing taking enough money now, or or keep on going and get as many days as possible to make it happen. But I was like, no, 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 we gave away the office. No, we actually didn't give away the office. We gave away the room that we were in and we went into the smaller office in that building. Um, and we did okay with that. And we we changed the way we were doing. We were doing face-to-face -face sales. We wanted to do online sales. That way we can re recruit people remotely and we can work as many hours as possible because it's online, you know? face-to-face uh, -face is more like you have to travel there and all these stuff so it was too uh, there was too much expenses there we thought online would be cool because i can just open the, the thing get on the zoom call and sell it but that didn't work because i never done it online <laughs> you see so who's there to teach me the things here hard and we had to close off everything but the person who stayed with me was my girlfriend here today the we made it official because we were there struggling trying to make it happen you can tell she was not just believing in in me you could tell she she wanted to be a part of the thing and she wanted to make it happen so a few uh, a few years forward 
uh, we went through all the struggle. We have to move places, different places. We stayed together and stuff. Then, uh, five months ago, we we said, she, obviously she said to me, hey, you're good at videos. We can go into media instead. And I was like, oh yeah, good idea actually. Cause I can make videos. We can, you know, you're good. You, you, you got all this journalistic thing on your background from school and I'm good at making videos. Why don't we become journalists, right? Why don't we make videos and report on current affairs or everything that's going on in the country? And she was like, yeah, good idea. Let's do it. So that was four months ago. We started again, new YouTube channel and you, you know where we are now. So we did that. Now we gain thousands of couple of uh, followers and the views and stuff. But the past two weeks in this journey, uh, obviously another huddle to go through. YouTube has, uh, had sus suspended me from posting for two weeks. Then now they've, sh I don't know if you call shadow ban or just not pushing my videos. Uh, it's not monetized. So it's like another struggle again, but it's okay. We'll go through it and I'm sure we're going to come out victorious. So that's what we're doing. And, uh, that's the that's dream. The Obviously dream. there's a lot more things that happen throughout the way, but yeah. you know, it's always so, short. That, that's a sort of good, um, synopsis summary of, of your life from before you were born when your family had to move out of Congo up until today. So just to go back on to a few of those points in your journey, Baraka, mm. am I correct? Was your mum pregnant with you when your family moved from Congo? Um, no. Uh, she was uh, pregnant with my older sister. Mm. But, so, but she never gave birth to her in in, in the refugee camp. She On the way. You, you have to realise it. So it's not, it's not like, uh, when you don't have enough money running from war, it's not as easy as you might think, because yeah, yeah. you have to go from that country, park here a bit, chill here a bit, try to figure it out, then run again, then run again. It's like, but if you have enough money, you can get in the airport done and go far away. But obviously they never had that much, that fortune to do so. So yeah, my sister was giving birth in in uh, another place on the way to the refugee. So how long did it take your parents to go from Congo and eventually arrive in the refugee camp in Tanzania? So, um, I'm sure a couple of months, yeah, for sure. That's amazing. That's a, that's a story in itself, Baraka. A couple of months. Then, for sure. You were born in Tanzania in the, the refugee camp. Yeah. What was, what, what was that like? I mean, what was your earliest memories of the situation and, and your surroundings? It was quite, it was quite like, uh, compared to where, where we are today, where I am today, it was kind of, it was, so you're, obviously you're born there, like you're there and you're just seeing stuff that like it's not as fancy stuff so like the roads are not well the road never mind the road they just just stand everywhere it was when i when i was really young if i could go as far as what i can remember it was sand everywhere right dust and more people was running from different walls because there's a lot of things has happened you know sudan all these places yeah. people was running there because it was a refugee camp that was set up by the i think unicef uh, to help out people who are struggling through walls and stuff. So more people came in and the more people that came in, they started building a little, it was like, you know, those little, uh, if, if, if a strong storm comes, your house disappears. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah it was basically like that. Most pe a lot of people used to lose their houses because let's say a strong, big weather comes through, you lost it. Or maybe some people used to die because it will fall on you at night, whatever. So it was that kind of struggle where you come in, you try to build somewhere in your corner and try to feed your family. And most people used to make, uh, I remember my, my, my mom, she was, she's pretty good at business. This, this is one thing I think I learned from her. From her. Uh, she was able to create food from like, uh, she was able to make sure everybody's fed from random stuff. She, she would have a little, uh, little farm, I would say farm, but she would grow stuff literally outside behind the housing 
and those things will grow and somehow those are the things that we're eating and uh, she'll go and make deals maybe she'll grow those things and go exchange it with uh, with me so they had a lot of barter system that were, were, were going on most people didn't have money because there was not any sort of jobs for you to get to you have to figure out what you're gonna make and um, my dad used to be <laughs> believe it or not my dad used to cut trees and sell it so <laughs> so uh, if you wanted uh, uh, so he used to go cut trees and and sell it to people wood and people used to make whatever they want to make with it tables chairs he used to sell that to them and i remember one time he lost his le it, well not lost but he broke his leg because a tree fell on top of it he almost died he was, he was paralyzed for like a couple months it was, it was wow. sad really so i remember that that's how far i can go but but when i came here things change because you're seeing things that you've never seen before only the only the things that you're seeing it was maybe if you watched the movie back then now you're seeing it in real life you're like wow so so when i'm here and see people who come from over there and they come here then they're acting like like it's a normal thing like they're acting like they deserve everything i i just don't understand so so you yeah. you, you gotta be grateful you know no i appreciate that so see the um the refugee camp that you were in, what size was it and how many people are, are in this place? Uh, uh, size? I don't know how big it was, but it was pretty big. I never went from A to... I never, never went from end to end, but I'm sure it was quite big. But no, it wasn't that big. So it got bigger uh, what, uh, uh, throughout the years. It got bigger throughout the years because places that I used to go play with friends when before coming here those places didn't ex didn't exist anymore because they had houses there places that my brothers used to go and uh because i got two big brothers uh sadly we lost one uh this time last year a month ago. so uh those they used to go outside to hunt to find food usually it's, it's like random stuff that they could find out obviously it's eatable of course and uh I remember I used to go with them sometimes if they let me, if they're brave enough, or maybe if they didn't notice I was with them because <laughs> I always wanted to do all this crazy stuff as well. So they had like slingshots, everything, you know, they could catch a, a, a bird, they could catch a, any sort of, you know, uh, uh, stuff that people are eatable. So they, they was going far away, but before leaving, those people, far away there were houses there now wow. so i'm sure it got bigger and bigger and bigger i'm sure it's bigger now than what it was and do you know how many people are in this refugee camp Who, is oh, it today? Of thousands is it is it tens of thousands is it hundreds no, of millions? definitely not hundreds of thousands uh, uh tens of thousands for sure wow. yeah it's a lot of people yeah definitely not hundreds <laughs> and it, it wasn't just all families from Congo. You're saying it was from all different regions in Africa where there was there was wars and things all coming to Tanzania. Uh, most people who I can remember were from Congo. Yes, because that was uh, it was created for specifically for that. Right. So that was created in nineteen ninety something. So it was created specifically for that war because if you search it up online. You could see so many people died and so many people lost yeah, their home. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. That was it was a brutal one. Yeah, yeah. So that this, I think, as a as an outsider that's not lived the life you have, it's, it's mm. kind of hard to comprehend because my idea would be if you were in a, a refugee camp situation, that if it was UNICEF that were running it, they would feed you, they would clothe you, they would. Um, put a roof over your head, but what you're describing here is, is is different. What you're describing is people were creating their own home, people were going out and hunting. So, what, what sort of aid and help did you get from the, the likes of UNICEF? <laughs> so they gave you aid in terms of like um, every. I think I remember every two weeks they used to give you food. So now it's up to you for you to create other food because they'll they'll give you food based on the heads in the family, yeah. right? And we all know, obviously, they're going to calculate in terms of making sure everybody gets something. So they'll give you, let's say, a, a big uh, uh, sack of rice, yeah. and you have to eat that for two weeks. Mm -hmm. 
but usually it will probably last you nine days. Yeah. Or it probably last you depending how how you can squeeze it in. But most of the time it never lasted the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, in terms of places for you to stay, they used to give you a a place where you can where you can like n- not a land but uh like an area where it's like okay this is reg- we can register this to you right mm-hmm. and you have to figure out how you're gonna build there so either you're gonna either you use their sheds they give you you know those sheds the waterproof shed mm-hmm. and we all know those sheds are not strong right if one if you use it for two three months it's probably gonna start leaking or it's probably yeah, yeah. gonna be blown away at night you're gonna find yourself in the air somehow <laughs> so so people had to figure out how to build some people became builders i'm sure obviously some people had skills in congo that they came there with they were builders and stuff so yeah. people start trading their skills like okay i can build you a house hey okay then then you figure out how you're gonna pay them so usually how you pay them is you get your food and you decide either you're going to turn that food into money and pay him or you're going to give him your food. So mm. it's like that. But then obviously before moving out, people start creating jobs and uh, people start going to school. So there was more education that was put into place where people start becoming proper. There was actually a job now. Most of the job was a, a, a government given job, like uh, uh, working in a hospital, working as a teacher working helping out basically mm-hmm. so it was it was like that but but obviously some people that created a lot more oh, i wouldn't say, uh, i don't know if you can say wealth but created money from doing something there usually maybe being a butcher yeah you're making money because obviously you're you're getting money for that then maybe you can employ some people to help you out those jobs start coming out you know start rising uh, maybe if you had something that you wanted people to do and you're making money from it, then you can start help getting people in to help you out. Then those small little jobs start being created, start getting created throughout the way. I'm sure there's probably more jobs now than 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 there were when I was there. And your family, <coughs> how long were they in the um, the camp before you were born? Uh, I'll probably say three years for sure. I'll probably say the family, the family are in this this situation for about 13 14 years then in total yeah 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 before they came to uk and how how does that work um did, did you go through a, a process applying for other countries or did you decide you want to come to uk or did they just tell you we've got your place in another country and off you go how, how does that whole thing work so, itself so out? You have, uh obviously i was pretty young to know yeah. this but i'm sure my, my parents throughout learning throughout these things they had to go through a process then either you uh, they vet you so the process can take up to five plus years so i'm sure some people who are still some people are probably waiting some people probably got rejected and they they figure out or some people don't even wait that long because then wanted to go somewhere else some people risk it yeah of course um so you have to wait there's a process then you get a meeting and you you have to tell uh, it's like a case where you have to build and uh, and then they figure out if they want you in or not and uh, uh, uh people countries like us were taking canada's australia uh, a lot of countries that came wanted to take refugees from there to help them out so 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 uh, well, i'm glad uk was the one that came to help us out yeah because I don't know how my life would be in any other country. You know, you can't imagine it, right? I think... Uh, yeah, yeah. So, like, so it's basically a lottery at that point. That you, you could have ended up in Canada. You could have ended up in Australia. You could have ended up... Wow. Yeah, so it's not really child. a choice. It's not really you, you your family yeah. saying you want to go there. They just say, look, we've got a place safe for you and it's out of the concentration camp. That's amazing. Now, yeah, yes. Yeah. You're not you, making a choice. Any country could have come and be like, yeah, we, we can help you. Yeah. You can't say no because, like... Well, you got nothing better to do, you know. Yeah. So it's either you say no and be like, "Yeah, I'm just gonna struggle here." Which oh, way yeah. Do that. But yeah, an, an interesting thought then, because your family have went through a process as refugees, and this is yeah. something yeah. I talk about a lot. I say I don't have a problem with refugees because humanity. If someone's in a war torn situation that your family are in and they have to leave there, and other people can help, then you should help. That's a normal human 
trait. Yeah. But my problem is the illegal immigrants who are just flooding the place, we don't know who they are, there's no controls, there's no numbers. Because mm. of the process that your family went through and had to go through and it took years and you were in a situation where, you know, things could have been better. I'm not suggesting your refugee camp was bad, but, you know, I can think yeah. of a lot of better places to be during your, your youth. So yeah. when um, when you see the illegal uh, uh, um, asylum seekers come to the country, what do you feel about them? What's your opinion on that situation? Personally, my opinion, I think, is uh, is a bit is it's not fair to the people who are waiting in line, because whoever crosses the boat right now is taking a, a taking uh, the opportunity for somebody who's been waiting for 10, yeah. 15 years in a camp. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. So, so, so maybe we could have came here sooner. I don't know. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. Maybe somebody who's waiting there should have been here who actually needs help. Yeah. But, no, that, that's but, a great point. So when somebody comes here illegally, not that they're breaking the law here in this country, but they are undermining the, the line. They, they are literally making themselves feel more superior that they don't have to go through the process. Yeah. Especially when they come here, then they get everything. It's like, really? So so for me, I think it's unfair for, for this country itself, for the people here in this country. And also it's unfair for whoever who has been has been applying to come here. And also, I think it's unfair for the people who, because uh, as I mentioned, my girlfriend, she's going away soon, right? Because she had to renew her visa, right? Mm -hmm. So that's unfair on her because you see how much, it, I'm sure you know how much it costs to go outside the country and apply for a visa to stay here, right? Mm -hmm. right. right. Come a business uh, as a, uh, and try to come back here. And she has to go through the process. Now she's going back, stay there, apply for a visa, wait for her to know that she can come here uh, that's gonna cost a lot of money then get a plane and come here and wait here till the time finished and go back renew it all this back and back and forth i think it's unfair for those people who are very generous to follow the law you know because yeah, yeah. i mean these people are i i don't I, the idea of like country is you have your borders and nobody can cross them unless you let them too Right, which is through planes, through flights, through visas and stuff. But now the idea of borders is, is, is the line is becoming so blurred to the point where anybody can walk through, mm -hmm. and that's unfair to the people in this country. I think it's very unfair. Yeah, well, I'm just thinking as you're talking there, Baraka. You're saying that you, your family, may have been able to come to Britain or any other place around the world quicker if it wasn't for illegal asylum seekers basically trying to jump the queue, right? Mm. I actually think it's worse than that. We're talking, and I'll tell you why. There is only so many people each country in the world can take, or it gets to a busting point and they run out of houses and stuff, right? Mm. So for we're getting flooded by, by illegal immigrants and you know fake asylum seekers. The mm. proper families in need like yours might never get to come here because yeah. we're full. So if, if we wiped out all those illegal immigrants, we'd, wiped out, we'd never had a problem with fake asylum seekers, then how many people would be here leading the life that you're leading just now that are actually still stuck in refugee camps around the world? Because we can't, you know, if Britain could take 30 to 50,000 a year comfortably, but we're taking 1.2 million just now illegally, mm. then if those illegal ones never came, we could we could help a lot more people that are in proper need, like your family's story. But with those coming in, they'll get to a point with countries all around the world that they can take the proper, you know, process driven asylum seekers like your family. And that, that concerns me. Because there could be people still stuck in these places you'll never get out of them. Simply because yeah. there's loads of people coming in, jumping the queue, and I don't think half of them. I've got stories like your story, your family story as a genuine flee from terror, had to get out of a country, and were genuine refugees and, 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 and lived in a refugee camp for 13, 14 years, waiting for a process to allow them to get safe passage somewhere else. That's the way, unfortunately, the system has to be, because it has to be controlled. Yeah. If there was nobody jumping the queue and there was nobody coming here under fake asylum and using European Convention laws to keep them here and 
you know, cheating the system. The new family's journey might have been five years. It might have been six years. I don't know. So, yeah, yeah. That, that's, a, that's a different set. And that's why I enjoy talking to people like yourself who have got, you know, a lot of different backgrounds and you, you look at things with a different um, set of eyes as me. So you've lived it. And it's interesting to hear, that, you know, your, your opinion on it. So when you get here, mm. when you talk about the snow and thinking, well, you've never seen this before. I think there's, there's been a lot of deprivation to a lot of people all around the world. You know, my own, you know, Scotland and Glasgow as well. We have situations with, you know, poverty, et cetera, not to the degree that you've had to live through in a, in a camp, but it's all relative. Mm. And what you, when you talk to people who have been brought up in sort of tough areas or rough areas or deprived areas, mm. you don't know you're deprived. You don't know that you're poor when you're in that situation because mm. you're a young kid, five, six-year-old, you don't understand the value of money. You don't understand that there's people living in Beverly Hills and mansions. You just see mm. what's round about you. Uh, is that similar when you're in a, in a, um, uh, a camp where it's all you've ever known? No, no, no. It's totally different because when you're in a camp, you can only imagine... You can only imagine there's a car out there that can cost 1.5 billion pounds. Bugatti. There's only a car. You can only imagine there's a big house there. You can put 15 plus people in there. You can only imagine those. Because, and your imagine is not as clear because you don't know if it exists. Right? So, so what, when you get to the place like UK, you're seeing big buildings. You're going to London. You're seeing underground. You're like, whoa, no way. People are living here and people are down here. You're like, what is going on? You've seen things that you've never seen before. You see skyscrapers. You see people wearing suits. And you see, you, you're like, wow, that, that pair of cloth can cost more than this house. And you've seen all these things. Then you go on this side and you see somebody else struggling. Then you pick your fate. Where you want to be in life? Maybe you want to be a businessman. Maybe you want to contribute to the country. You want to hire as many employees. You want to do all this. You want to contribute. Blah, blah, blah. But you, Because you've seen all this. I would not have been here. I would not thought, okay, today I'm going to be a journalist sitting here having thousands of people who want to tune in every single Friday and listen to me talk and get information from me. I never thought I would be here, right? Yeah. Because the only time I wanted to become a YouTuber, I wanted to be make videos was when I was here. Do you get it? When I was here, I had that, I was opening to people like KSI, people like Logan Paul. I'm like, Oh, these guys are young. They're doing silly stuff on camera. Uh, not silly stuff, but entertaining people. Oh, then you see movies. You're like, wow, that's a, you know, that's a, that's Denzel Washington. You're like, wow, that guy is a good actor. I want to be like that. Because you've seen it. But in a in refugee camp, you're not seeing that. You're just seeing every single morning you have to get up, get your bucket and go to the, to the Welsh and pump it out, put water in that bucket and bring it back home so your mom can make food that's what you're doing or maybe you put your your your, your gear on and you go help out your little brothers or your big brothers into trying to cut trees because you need to sell that tree to people who are making tables mm. that's what you're saying so the dream of wanting to become the next big thing is not there you yeah. you only dream as far as what you can see yeah. but hey you know Th th that's the difference yeah. that you it's, a, it's a similar thing in respect to when you're there and in that situation then that is just your world it's not until you come out of that situation where you think wow that was a real tough time but when you're mm -hmm. there it's just your life so do, yeah what do, what, what do you know about when you're in there you're you know you're 10 years of age what do you know about the outside world uh, so, again so what do I know about those the same world when you're there, do you you know do you have access to television and things like that? That you're 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 <laughs> learning what's going round going on in other places in Africa and in Europe and America, or is it just basically can you know contained in your your whole world as the the gates of that camp? No, no. So I've never seen a big phone that you can press on the screen until I was until I was until I came here. We didn't have a phone in my family. My parents never had a phone. We had to go somewhere pay them money, tell them to put this number so we can call somebody who's outside the, the camp. Yeah. That's, we never had a phone. We didn't have a TV inside. Never mind electricity. You got uh, 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 what you call those things. Uh, 
you light it up. It's like a lamp. Uh, yeah. Not a lamp, but you light it up. You put oil inside, yeah. and uh, I don't know if you if you notice what I'm saying. Oil lamp. Oil lamp. Oil lamp. Yeah, you have oil lamp. So if you don't have oil there, there's no light in dark time. Usually people have to get things done quick in the daytime, so to make sure when nights come, you're comfortable, you're already air, you're already good, and you can just go to sleep and wake. So you know you got uh uh uh. uh you got like uh, 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 what you call the sun waking you up. So there's not all these uh, equipment like or oh, TV. I'm gonna tune into the cartoons today. Oh, oh, I'm gonna watch this show today. No, there's none of that because you don't have electricity. The the most luxurious thing we had in our house was a radio, which my dad used to li- used to play music all the time. When he wants to pass time and he's sitting there after doing all this work, he plays the radio and listen to the news. And that's it. That's the lo- the most luxurious thing we had in our house. You know, most people don't even close their house because there's nothing to steal. What, what are you going to steal? Yeah. You're going to steal the little rack they put on the floor to sleep on? You're not going to steal that because uh, uh, that's what they give you. When you come to the camp, they give you that little thing. It's not a mattress. It's like a little thing you put. It's, it's as thin as this. Yeah. And you sleep on that. Yeah. And... uh so there's not all these fancy stuff. We never had a phone. So we had to go re- somewhere else to make a phone. Can you remember the day you learned you sorry, first gosh, were you able to leave the refugee camp at all? Or was that just not not allowed? So um uh, uh they have to know where you're going because they can't just let you just wander out in the world and wherever. So they they used to be policed around. Where if you're traveling outside the camp, you're telling them where you're going. Yeah. Right? So that way they're aware that one person is outside. Yeah. Did you ever go outside the camp as a, as a child? The, ne- the, the only time I left that camp was when we came here. I've never left that oh, camp. Wow. So in 11 same years. With the parents, same with everything. Yeah, I was 11, born there. Yeah. You, you never left this, what, maybe a few miles wide camp? That was that. That was your whole life contained in that. That's it. You're in the camp. You're only leaving the camp if you're going somewhere that the officials, people who police the camp know. And the only time we left the camp with the family was when we came here. So some people are born in that camp and die in those camps. So they've never wow. seen any sort of thing. So when you're sitting here and you're seeing how entitled some people are in, in these sort of Western country, and you're seeing how all the immigrants that come into Western countries and act like they, are, they own everything, you're sitting there, you're like, mate, mate. Come on, like, stop fuffing around and get something done. You're here. Be grateful, you know? So, that's the that's the thing. It's, it's not that... It, it, so, it's not the world where you can just go and be like, yeah, it's fine. No, it's not actually fine. When you get out of it, now you can actually build something for yourself. Because when you're in it, there's nothing to build. Who's going to hire you? Where are you going to make the money? You want to become a businessman? What are you selling to who? So, they can give you their rice. So, they can yeah. give you their potatoes yeah. unless it's that then there's nothing else so there's can, can you remember the day that your family got the news that you were you were to leave the camp and you had somewhere to go can you remember that day uh i was uh i i wasn't familiar i, I didn't know that i was gonna leave until we left because uh, i was very young so they're not telling me the stories like oh yeah pack it up we're gonna go no you we going son <laughs> you know it's like that like we're going today. Like, yeah, today. I remember that. I only remember the time that I left. The the day that I left, it was really sad because I had to wave to my to my uh, to my friends and stuff. It was really really sad. I remember that. Like, my uncle gave me a a a pound. I think it's a shilling. They use shilling. Shilling. He gave me that to remember him. I lost it like a couple a uh, couple years ago. I think 2017. I held that thing. That was the closest thing I can remember. So that was when you get in and you go because you uh, you don't own anything there. Mm. It's not like you got a house. You don't even have a house. You just have a little place that you were given to stay there. Mm. So when you're leaving, you only carrying whatever you have, like your clothes. That's it. It's not like you got a TV. You got a packet as well. No. Mm. So. So it was a quick, uh, I, I, there was a, I don't remember celebrating. There was not any sort of celebration because uh, I actually don't. I think there was a lot of prayers. 
I remember that because my parents, the, the family is very religious. My, my, my dad was a pastor and he still is a pastor. Uh, my mom is, uh, it was a church ministry. So we, we uh, my family are really, really re- religious. So I remember there was a lot of prayers that it gets pulled through by grace of God. I remember there's a lot of church people coming home and pray for us to make it safe. So mm-hmm. it's like a community thing. And uh, that's all I remember. But I don't remember going out there and drinking the beer and be like, yeah, yeah. we're going. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> it, was almost, it was almost instant. It was just, here, we're going. And, that was, and before you, you walked out of that camp, did you know where you were going? Did you know you were going no. to UK? No, no, no. I didn't know. I, I'm sure my parents knew where they were going. I'm sure they, they, they knew we were coming to the United Kingdom. Oh. But I didn't know where, where we'd be going. I, I just thought, okay, we're going somewhere outside this camp. So you mentioned oh, your coming to UK. Yeah. So you you mentioned your uncle. Was he in the refugee camp, and you had to leave him? Yeah, yeah, we had to leave because uh, obviously his family. So uh, y- your family is going, and uh, if I don't know what ha- where he went, but but yeah, so, I think I think he I think he stayed there a couple of years until something happened to him as well. Now, you had friends when you were young in the camp that you can remember having to leave and you were probably sad thinking, well, you know, A, you're lo- losing your friend, but B, mm. you're, you're leaving them in that situation and you're going on to something better. Have you had any uh, contact with any of the kids that you were brought up with in the camp or any, your uncle, for example, have you had no contact with him since? So with, fr- so, uh, with friends, there's no, there's no way you can find mm. them. It's not like... Because I don't have a phone. They don't have a phone. I'm mm-hmm. coming to the UK. Uh, I, 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 obviously, I've got a process to learn English, to be able to uh, uh, make money, get a phone. By the time you get that, you don't know them anymore. You don't remember who they were. Mm-hmm. Where are you going to search them on Facebook? You don't mm-hmm. know if they have that. Because there's not even, there's not a big phone with a screen there when I left. So you don't know. But only thing you can do is if your parents had somebody's number over there, and let's say they got here and they called back to say we got here safe, then then maybe you can get that phone, those people to get your one of your friends to speak to. And usually it, there's too much scarcity uh, uh, on the an amount of time you got to speak because obviously you got to top up that phone. So, uh, and the only person we were speaking to is like even close family people that my parents had their number saved long time because... It's not like I'm going to tell my friend, hey, hey, your eight-year-old, give me your phone number. <laughs> when I get there, I'll call you. No, because their parents don't have a phone too. It's like, what is going on? So usually you have to tell them, you have to call. There was like a call center. Some guy probably made, had a phone. Some guy had a phone where, where you, you go there to make a call to somebody. So, so you call that person and tell that person to tell one of your friends to come there uh, around this time, this day, because you're going to make a call that day. Mm-hmm. Do you get it? Yeah, yeah. So it was it was really like, when you watch back in the day's film, that's what it basically was in 2011 and, and 10 and 15, all that. I'm sure obviously it's probably different now because they probably have Wi-Fi and every yeah. single thing we have here too. These kids that you were brought up with, can you remember any, you know, their names and things like that? Or is that too distant for you now? Oh, no, 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 I can't. But I can, I, I remember the family friends. I remember one of my, uh, this was my best friend. who always will. It's my cousin as well. Uh, he's in US now. Uh, he obviously went through the process too. And luckily US picked him up. He's a good guy, really good guy. I want to meet him one day. Uh, we, we talk, he's doing his business as well. But he's busy. He wants to help out uh, uh, children in places like war con- uh, 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 places. So he's he has like a charity that he's built, and uh, uh, yeah, he's doing really well. He's oh. going through school. He, he already he graduated this year. I was really proud of him. Graduating US, he can speak English, he can write, he can do all the stuff. Now he's making a business. So it's like the proud you have. I think you can tell who's actually a proper immigrant when they come to a country they know how to they want to thrive they don't want to destroy anything they're like oh yeah we're here thank god we're here let's get to work 
Let's mm-hmm. build something. Let's do something. Let's cre- let's 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 scratch our name on the on the stone here in the UK as well. We're here, you know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we're not here to say all oh, these. We don't here to chant every Saturday about whatever heck is going on. So you can just tell. And uh, I think when we got here, it was brutal because my parents got to work straight away. You know what I mean, they, they had nine months to learn English. That's what they gave them nine months to learn it. And my dad, he went through that and he got, he was working at one time free jobs. And usually because you don't have the education over here. So you got to do the menu, uh, the small little job, like cleaner. You had two cleaning jobs and he still has two cleaning jobs today, you know? And he's done very well for himself, for somebody who's not having all these fancy degrees here to get a proper good job. You know, you can just yeah. tell, he's not just sitting there and be like, yeah, I deserve everything. No, he's going out there and doing it. And I could see with everybody who came here who actually is a proper immigrant, they're actually trying to figure it out, to be on themselves. But when people come here and sit and be like, all right, thank God, uh, what we do now, let me chill and start smoking. Let's start walking around with knife. Let's start doing this. Then that's when you know, okay, this guy did not need help. Hmm. Because if he didn't need help, he would do something better for himself. I yeah. think that that's when you realise, yeah, this... So, no. talking to you, it's making me think families that have been through the, the trauma that your family had to go through, when you eventually get here or America or whatever it is you end up, the appreciation is, I've got a second chance here and I want to make something. But yeah. don't. are they people then that have cheated the system then and just they've not really had... They're here through choice, not through, um, you know, they didn't need to maybe leave their own country and they maybe feel a wee mm-hmm. bit more entitled. Is that, is that where the difference comes in, Baraka? I, I, th- I think so. It does play a little bit of a role here because uh, I remember, because I, I, I don't know what my parents have gone through through the, I, I can't really see what they went through, but through the stories that my mom tells me, it's kind of brutal because uh, the, day that, the day that they had to run was a night time when when they start hearing guns everywhere yeah uh, they knew it was gonna happen but they didn't know it's gonna get to the to where they was quick yeah it was like rebels the rebels are killing everybody they were killing everybody they're just shooting out if you have a car that you lost that car if you have a tv you've lost it. if you have a house you've lost it and i remember she tells me a story that when that thing broke out she has to wait she had to wait her, uh, my mom and my dad had to wake up all the kids yeah, so they can start running at night. Houses already, they can, they can see houses already set on fire. Everything, people are de- getting killed, shots, fires, guns everywhere. And she ran. So he, here's the story. It's kind of sad when you hear it as well. And it's kind of actually cool as well. I would like to make a movie about this, to be fair. I mean, it, once we make enough money to be, to be able to fund films, I would like to make a movie of this. Where they ran... She woke up, she woke up, my, obviously my dad, everyone's awake. The people who can run, so my, my big brother can run. Uh, she, she picked up my sister, uh, um, uh, my sister, she picked her, her up because she was really young. She picked her up. Then my dad had to go pick up the other son, yeah, so they can run, right? But here's the trick. So my dad picked up, thought he picked up the son, but he didn't really pick him up. He picked up the blanket. He thought the, blank, the son was wrapped in the blanket. So now they're running. They are far away. Oh, yeah. the kid in the house. He realized he doesn't have the kid with him. He has a blanket. No. Because he's that like, you know, like, you you know, you're running. Yeah, you're, like, yeah. you're, you're opening everything that you can grab. What, what can you grab? What, what? You got nothing. You're just trying to grab the kid and get out. Right. Then you realize later on, you're like, where is he? Wow. And that's when you see, that's when you see the love of, the love that female mothers have for their kids is is totally something else. Mm-hmm. My mom said, you stay here. <laughs> you stay here with these kids. I'm going back to get my son. So she ran all the way back. My dad doesn't know if she's going to come back, but she had, he, he had to keep these two kids together as well. Yeah? And he's trying to walk back slowly so then they can, when she's coming, she made it back. She picked up the son. He's all, he was already crying. And this, they met somewhere else. It's like, oh my days. You know, I don't know if I would... I don't, 
So when she tells me this story, I always want to hear it. I've, 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 I, she's told me this story so many times. I'm always trying to get details into this because because I like movies. I would like to play this movie. I would like to make this like a movie where it gets premiere on cinema and people can actually see. So when when these guys have gone through something and there's probably many more of the stuff that they've gone through as well, you know, that that they don't want to tell us as well. So, so when they get here, they have an appreciation to like thank God they helped us type of uh, type yeah. of appreciation. But when somebody comes here illegally, they have nobody to appreciate, only themselves. They're like, "Yeah, we're here. I got yeah. myself here. What the heck are you gonna tell me?" Type of kind of uh, 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 type of uh, arrogant. So, so it does play a part because they didn't have to wait in line. You know, yeah. they didn't have to. To be patient they didn't have to uh, the the country didn't come and save them they have the mindset of they saved themselves yeah so therefore you got nothing to tell them so, so it does play a part into uh into all these sort of uh, uh, uh what's so, going on yeah it does people listen to this and people that have been brought up in the uk and Maybe other a few that were brought up. They maybe had things that they had to worry about as kids, and they maybe were a wee bit poor, and maybe didn't get the nice trainers that other people got. But when you hear your story and you think, "My God, it doesn't matter how bad my life was as a kid," yours was just so different, right? But see, during that time, and this this is something that interests me with, with loads of people's stories. <clears throat> it doesn't matter how bad it is. There's always some happiness. There's always some things that you, you remember fondly. What, what's the most fond memories you have of this time and what was, looking back, a horrific situation? But there would have been times where, you, you know, things were nice, something happened, you, you were, you know, you're a kid just being a kid. What, 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 what things can you remember that were sort of positives and happy? Yeah. The the one thing that, that is, it gives me a lot of joy was... Uh, was uh, every year on on New Year's, they celebrate New Year's. New Year's, Christmas, it's like, it's like you're working the whole year or whatever you're saving, you're saving for New Year's and Christmas. Yeah. And New Year's, uh, as kids, we used to get new stuff. So new shoes, new slippers, new sandals. You, you're looking dapper, like you're looking good. New pants, new stuff. Because... Yeah. Uh, it's it's a thing where you gotta look new. You gotta be like going into the new year. Mm-hmm. You gotta enter looking fresh. So it's a mm-hmm. thing. So so they'll spend whatever they have to make sure we have that kind of luxury as well. Yeah. So so we, we we could drink proper drink like a like a you know those uh proper rack you, uh, those uh there's proper drink, you know, where you open it with a thing. It was nice. We eat rice. I think rice was the most expensive thing. Rice and meat was the most expensive thing there because that had to come from somewhere. Yeah. Because they weren't able to grow it there. Yeah. So that was rice, meat. Uh, uh, those stuff that were more of like, oh, we, we don't eat this every day. Stuff. So that's yeah. what we used to have on, on Christmas and uh, New Year's, so those five days there. It was nice, it was good, because you're not in school, so you're just celebrating till the next year. And uh, one thing, because my mom's birthday is uh, is on a Christmas day, so okay. that gives you another pump to like, yeah, have another <laughs> have another drink. So those days, I can vividly remember how nice those days were, were really nice, because everybody's together, everybody's celebrating uh, uh, the new, chapter of life we made it here we're here and also because a lot of people all, most people there were christians so there was a lot of this christmas type of yeah. excitement yes so th- those times were really good but when, that was really where there's yang there's yang and where there's that there's light so can you remember anything or were you too young to consider at any time and sinking in that this is pretty this is a tough show this is the fun was there any times where you you know you had sort of those thoughts as a child or were you just too young uh, everything i don't know why but everything was fun to me because i was i didn't know what was going on you see 
but I'm sure it was not uh, one thing I remember that was a bad thing. That the only thing I can say, yeah, this was really, really bad. Was when when I seen my uh, my because uh, because what happened is is so my parents they're really good at like making things work, like figuring something out and creating something with what they have. So my my mom used to sell the stuff, the food that we get from NHS uh, from uh, from the charities. She would squeeze it in and sell some parts. And she'll keep the money. She'll squeeze it in and sell some power. We had a little, you wouldn't call it farm, but we had a little a little place where we had things growing. Those are the things that we're eating. And most things that we get, we squeeze it in. We save some bit to eat and we sell some of the stuff. So they, they created something. Then she got my dad to stop cutting trees because that was dangerous because obviously he lost his leg on that. So So she got him to stop doing trees. Instead, she wanted him to start selling soap to start selling sweets, to start selling stuff. So my dad used to travel uh, outside from the camp, escorted by the police, to go into Tanzania on proper the, the actual place and buy soap, you know, those long soap that you have to cut. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But he'll buy those soap, like five different soap. He'll bring it into a bag. He'll come into the camp and sell those soap. And and he got, you know, he did that for a few months and somehow he grew. And now he was going with two bikes, him and my big brother were going and bring it. Nice, right? Then they created a little shop, right? They built a little shop, right? Yeah. Where they had a lot of soap there. They had a lot of creams. They have all these sort of things that they were selling. And people started coming and it grew. It grew. It was so big now. Now to the point where my mom didn't have to sell the, the food anymore. Food, yeah. Now we had money coming through. Then we yeah. bought a phone. This was literally before coming here. But before coming here, that shop was robbed that was sad that was sad because uh, i don't know why but somebody knew that how he used to lock the shop and bro it was because that's when i seen everybody like you know when you see your parents sad you're like yeah that is sad because <laughs> nothing's happening you're not going for anything because you're eating still you're sleeping well you know you're a kid you don't know but when you see everybody sad you're like yeah, that must be really sad. That wow. meant something. And it, it did mean something to a lot of people because cause it was a shop that me, my brother can hang in there and sell whatever that when people come to buy stuff. And we seen that happening. I vividly remember him getting on a bike and go buy it. And some, he'll wake up early morning, 5 a.m. because he has to go on a the bike. There's no car. 5 a.m. he'll be out, gone. And he'll come back probably like late at 9 o'clock. Sometimes we, we, we didn't know what happened to him. You know, uh, and they would come back later at night. So it was really these sort of struggle that you had to go through. Then the shop got robbed. That was really sad. That's the only thing I can remember that was like, oh. yeah, that's horrible. So did you, what nationality do you see yourself as? Because you, 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 your, your family are from Congo, but I, I think, have you yeah. never set foot in Congo? I've never been, no. Right. So I've you've never, never been foot there. You were born in Tanzania. You spent half your yeah. life so far in Tanzania, and now you're in the UK. Yeah. How do you? Yeah. I don't, don't think pigeonhole because I don't like that. But how do you view yourself uh, nationality-wise? Uh, some people say, "On my on my ID, I go with what it says on my ID. It mm. says I'm Congolese born in Tanzania. Mm. That's what it says. So I That's go what, with it. Yeah. But some people might argue, "Oh, you're Tanzanian." all right put it on the id because if i go to the airport they're gonna look at the id and be like all right okay good yeah. you know what i mean so yeah. so that's what i go with that's what it says on my best so you've got congo it's... passport no 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 uh yeah, hey. yeah, yeah. so so he, he says that nationality congo but, but it says that on your british passport yeah so place right. born uh, is tanzania yeah so yeah. that that's what it says, and that's what I go with. Amazing. So, so have it, you ever <laughs> had any urges to go and visit Congo, or have you had ever had the feeling that you would like to go back and visit the camp that you were brought up in, or do you want to just leave uh, that? As? I'm not sure, but I, I've not I, I've not thought of that. But I think um, I would like to go and see how the camp and and walk through. Uh, and walk through what I seen when I was young. So, mm -hmm. so, 
that that is for me i would want to do that and also i would want to see tanzania for itself because tanzania is actually a good nice country it's mm-hmm. it's safe it's good it's lovely it's got it's 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 nice i would like to see it because i never really seen tanzania i was born there but i've never really seen it because i was in the camp i left that camp to go somewhere else so mm-hmm. i've never actually went through the city and be like oh oh that's dar es salaam oh that's this oh nice nice I would like to actually go, but most importantly, I would like to go in the camp and see for myself. If they obviously, if they would let me, of course, I would like to actually see like, wow, you know, uh, it's a, yeah, yeah, it's a thing. It's real. The camp still exists. Yes, it does exist, especially now with the war in in Sudan and all these things. So obviously, those people are, are mostly probably running there. Oh. I'm not sure if it's close to them, but why don't we both go? You know, I coach kids it's football. It's we'll take a bag of balls and a bag of football strips and we'll go and we'll give them to the kids and we'll get them to smile and you can learn that, some stuff and make some videos. That is good. Let's do that. I mean, I think that's really good because a lot of kids there would like to play football. Trust me, when, when I was there, I I wanted to be a footballer too because I, I, I knew I could be on camera. Anything to be on camera, I wanted to be. But... But yeah, so football, there's a lot of good players there. You, oh man, you'll see people, you'll be like, how the heck is this guy not playing pro? But then you realize, oh no, there's no professional team here. <laughs> so they are really good. I think that'll be really good. Yeah, let's do it. Let's, let's, let's do, do it, that. man. I do, let's do I, it. Uh, when I started Mon Football Club about nine years ago, and mm. um, there was a couple of kids with African descent from the early days. But then there was one man brought his kid. It was a st- mad story. There was a mm. guy from... Where was the big boy from? I think he may have been Zimbabwe. Mm. And he worked in an African shop near me. Right. And mm. my local pub where I'd go and watch TV had a bus stop outside it. And this big guy yeah. would work to know him as Dubs. And Dubs mm. would be standing in the bus stop waiting to go home after he's work in the African shop. And when there was mm. European football on during the week, he would sometimes be standing at the window like this, looking through, watching the TV. And we're like, come in and watch the TV. <laughs> so big Dubs <laughs> used to come in and watch the football we was in the pub. And he was funny because he was just a big, massive, junk, junk of black guy, right? And uh, yeah. he used to be asking to come to Rangers Celtic matches as the months went on. Mm. And then he was going back home to Zimbabwe and mm. he um, was having a party in the shop to say cheerio. So he invited me along and I hadn't been in the shop before. And it was just, just just selling African stuff. Bizarre shop for me. And I used to love going in and seeing all the different stuff. And there was this little kid, uh, he would have been about nine-year-old at the time, and Dubs, it was the owner's um, son. And he said, this is Mr. Craig. He runs a football team. And I says, oh, do you want to play football, son? And he says, I'd love to play football. Have you ever played football before? No, just on the Xbox. He said, will you come on <laughs> Tuesday? Boy came on Tuesday. And after two weeks, he was the best player on his team. He just had this great ability. And his dad was mm. a nice fella. And he settled in the teams quite quick. And then his dad would come to me. And say, Craig, mm. do you need any under 13s? What, what is it? He said, I've got a guy, he's at my church or he's one of the customers in my shop. Can mm. you get him to come and play? And I was like, ah, yeah, keep coming. So, because this guy's business, all his majority of his, his, his business customers were African, because it was an African shop he had. And he, he, he helped in an African church and he used to help teach English to the kids and to the folk that have just came over from Africa. And the congregation was all African. So it was quite, you know, quite a lot of, of um, connections in the African community. So every month or two, he'd, Mr. Craig, can I, can you, can I bring an under sixteen? Can I bring a boy at five? And we ended up with this massive amount of African kids <laughs> in the club, right? Yeah. Where is he finding them? <laughs> what? Uh, you're probably asking yourself, where is he finding all these kids? <laughs> well, it was quite funny because her crest has got a lion on it, right? See, so we must have been. We were African before we were African because our logo, our, our emblem was a lion. And um, yeah. I, I just didn't realise you know, the, the size of Africa and the different, you know, the kids for the West Africa seem to be more physical and strong and the yeah. kids from East Africa were thin 
and more mm. uh, energy, yeah. um, you know, long distance and things. And you're like, how's that? And you like, well, think about it. That's like one man being born in London and one man being born in Moscow. That's the size of Africa. Of course, it's going to be different. <laughs> and it, it, it yeah, was great. And uh, Dubs, uh, as I say, he went back to Zimbabwe. And I've always thought, we've done some things where we collected old kit and we've sent it to, you know, kids in Africa and stuff. But I would love to go mm. one day with a bag of kit and a couple of footballs and just have fun in a dusty part somewhere with some kids yeah. who never had you know, a proper kit on and kicked a proper yeah. ball. So we should maybe do yeah. that, but we'll get some money we together. Go. I think that would be really good, yes. Yes, that would be What's nice. next for you? Well, it's been great getting to know you a bit more during this, uh, on a bit, and hearing your, your story is phenomenal, Baraka. I think it's uh, a story that should inspire people, that it doesn't matter where you are, it's where you end up that's important. And, you know, sometimes we need to go through tough times and they're not necessarily all bad, but from where you've come to where you are just now is obviously a massive difference. So what, what what's next for you? What, what's your ambitions? Where do you, where do you want to be? Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> who is next for me? So here's the guy. Uh, I keep giving him kudos. Here's the guy, your next five move by Patrick Bet David. This is the person who changed everything. And I'll probably say is the reason why, why I have as much respect for people who do good stuff for their community, the country, and for themselves and family. So my next move is, is this. In the media space, I want to dominate into this channel on youtube on a smash that so the goal is to obviously next year is to hit as many uh, subscribers as possible of course throughout the quality that we put out people have to decide as well the market has to decide but the goal is to put it so many good videos out there really be realistic with people show what's going on with stuff and we got a new channel called next frontier that's a business uh, 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 news media outlet uh, right now it's on like a thousand subscribers so by monday next week that channel will be going live because uh we we now have acquired some well should i say uh, bring in some new guys so now it's gonna free me up to be on camera more often like right now we've, we've done this as soon as this is done my editors will pick it up and I don't know if you want to edit it for yourself, but they'll edit and post it and send it to you. Uh, and we've got a couple of videos that we need to do today. So there'll be more videos coming out. And the goal is next year is to have this channel, the main channel on over hundred, uh, over hundred K subscribers by next year. And the main, the small channel to have at least 25 to 50 K subscribers. And, uh, I want to, I want to be able to grow and, and and compete with the big media, right? Mm -hmm. Right. That's the goal right now in, in the media space, but also contribute and recruit as many people and keep it real to the people sure. who watch us. That's <coughs> the goal. Grow into a business, the, the whole channel will have, you know, it'll be self-sufficient. And yeah, I think your, your timing's superb because I think um, you can have the best ideas in the world, but if you're five, 10 years ahead of everybody else, your idea doesn't sit with everybody. And, you know, you, you could have a, I don't know, a gizmo, a product that's just too far ahead of everybody else that nobody's buying it today, but 10 years from now it might be the new smartphone. Yeah. And yeah. But with, with the media just now, I think the, the Western world we went through this whole cycle of, when I used to, when I was a kid, even when I was your age, not, you know, a young adult, when I turned on mm. the TV and someone told me something, I accepted mm. that as the truth. That to me yeah. was gospel. Didn't matter what they were telling me, that I accepted that. But we're now going full cycle that the mainstream media, people will not just automatically believe it. That's not to say everything they tell us is lies. But mm. people will now say, well, hold on, that's the story you've told me. Is that story true? Or is it 50% true? Or is it 0% true? And I think people like myself, yourself, are coming into this at the right time because... So many people I talk to nowadays do not turn on a traditional TV. They don't watch yeah. BBC. They don't watch ITV. They don't watch Sky mm. News. Everything that mm. they do, they're on social media, YouTube, mm. and 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 I think your your timing. Um, I mean, I, I I've done all right with this, and it's a year almost to the day that I started talking about politics on YouTube. 
because before mm. that, about four or five months after I started the channel, I was only doing interviews like this. That we're, this is what I've done, uh, the yeah. reason I set the channel up. And then 12 months ago, something happened in Scotland politically, and I thought, this isn't right, and I started doing political videos. And I'm an old yeah. dinosaur, mate. Right? I'm 51 year old and I've got 45,000 subscribers on YouTube. I like I don't understand how that happened, right? Yeah. But the timing's got a lot to do with it because yeah. I believe the way people are swinging. Um, and yeah. it, when your your news channel, what, what's it going to be? Is it going to be like just all news or political news, sports news, or just anything? It's going to be the news that matters. So we are going into revolution where things that are getting reported today, I don't think should be reported at all. Things that should be reported are like at the very, very bottom on a, on a website like BBC, yep. Yep. you know, like like the Ed Miliband story. Nobody's talking about it. Nobody has investigated into that story and tell you how it is. People have headlines. That's it. But they're not looking deeper. They're not request information from the government they're not doing that this is what we're going to be doing some of our videos are going to take a lot of time to to make and look into but it's something that the country needs to know so we got this slogan that says the nation needs to know so only, we're going to make videos only the nation needs to know videos that you and everybody else around the country should know about mm -hmm. like you know like uh the video that we're working on right now the the illegal immigrants uh, uh which is probably going to come out, not today, but it's probably going to come out tomorrow or the next day. This one is huge. Nobody's reporting it. I, have, I had to go through different sort of websites and connect the dots yeah. and report to people. Within like every single website, everyone, most news outlet in the UK report just a bit. But when you connect it all together, you get different news that yeah. I think should be packaged to one. So that's our goal. And... Uh, the goal with the main channel, which is the Baraka show, the goal is to get guests like yourself, uh, different guests like uh, uh, in, in obviously if they've done well for themselves and they do have a little voice that I think people need to know. And also get people from the street that have something that happened to them and they think that people should know. And anybody who wants to be heard, that's what the channel, the main channel will be about to see and speak to them. So like me and you, this the Baraka show, that's me just learning and talking with people. And over like Joe Rogan type of style, yeah, yeah. But the main will be, as I mentioned, the nation needs to know. So uh, we got uh, uh, one guy, uh, a new person who will be making videos. So this, there'll be two of us, and we also gonna have, I think, two two different editors. So everybody will have an editor. I'll have my own. They will have yeah. their own. That way we can like and wrap it up. That will be, be daily. Yes, the goal is to be daily. So the goal uh, right now, we, we try to make sure we have a lot of content that can always come out. Mm -hmm. So 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 you've seen nothing on it right now. We've not posted for like a two, three weeks. No, no, no we're not. It's not like we've done not doing anything. We've been doing something. So yeah. when it rolled out, it's rolled out. And also we'll be going live as well. So those videos will be obviously live streamed and stuff. But yeah, we've hit no, a lot of you. guests. And you're, you're spot on what you're saying about the mainstream media. And it's not even stuff. They just, there are things that they do report on. And I sit as mm -hmm. a non-journalist and think, that ain't the story. And I'll give you yeah. an example. On the 1st of August, I put out a video about the Southport issue. And I said, mm -hmm. this has got a terror link to it. Because here's what the police officer said in the press conference today. And I picked mm. up on the fact that they said that the anti-terror police were, mm. were involved, right? Now, that room was a press conference full of journalists. And even the journalists yeah. who were there would have watched it on a link. And none of them picked up on it. And you think, it's just, you know, they're not doing their job properly. Um, they're not. And I don't understand their job. So I'm maybe being harsh on journalists. I know some a lot of journalists, mostly sports journalists, because of my past. And, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to say journalists are bad. All I'm saying is it doesn't seem to me that they're looking for the story, that there'll be a story in front of them. They take that, they regurgitate it, and they put it out on their platform. Whereas I look and go, wait a minute, that woman just said, thanks to the, the Northwest anti-terror police who have helped us so far and will continue to help us in inquiry. And I went, well, if the yeah, anti-terror right. police are still there, it's because the anti-terror police have seen something connected to terror. Because if the anti-terror police had 
seen no contact or no connection with terror, guess what? They would have said, thanks very much. You guys continue with the murder investigation. We're away to look at Taliban or Al-Qaeda or ISIS, right? Because that's what anti-terror do. They're not there to help there's a side police on a murder inquiry. Murders happen all the time and just things like that. So I know good luck to you, mate. I'm sure you'll you'll be successful in anything you decide to do in your life because you seem to be a well-balanced, clever and driven individual. So um, well done. And I um, look forward to seeing you at the end of the month when I come down to Manchester for the, I, the conference. I, I can't wait for that. That'll be really cool. Really cool. So it's going to be it. sick. We'll get you in for the yeah. day. You know, there's a good timetable of speakers that you can you can watch and maybe report on, and then we'll be breaking away areas. We'll get you. We'll get you with your mm-hmm. mic, camera, and talk to whoever you want to down there and get you plenty of coverage. So hopefully you enjoy that. But uh, yeah, anything you want to tell that we've maybe not covered in the Baraka Baraka story? Is there anything that we've missed out? Uh, obviously, there's a lot of things that uh, we couldn't get to, but uh, obviously it's gonna we we can do it again. But it's yeah. just a matter of time because the, the story is long. A lot of things obviously happen to people in their life, but you can't really put everything out because that means you have to go through 23 years of my life, which obviously I don't think we can put in one video. But we can surely squeeze it in and make it one one hour and 30 minutes. But yeah. for today, I think I think that was enough. Uh, yeah. Obviously, we'll do more, of course, and we'll connect the dots together. Yeah. Well, listen, thanks very much for, for coming on, Barack, and again, thank you for having me on your own show. I enjoyed it as well. Thank you. Appreciate you for obviously making this happen. You're, you're the first person I've, uh, I usually interview over, yeah. but you're the first person I got on to speak about myself. So, yeah, rose of switch. Spending yeah, thank it you. Appreciate it. No, no problem, That's mate. It. So, listen, all, all the best, and uh, I'll see you at the end of November, and uh, we'll maybe chat more about getting a couple of backpacks and going to Tanzania for a, a wee trip. That would be that would be entertaining. Yeah. All right. So thanks very much, mate. All the best. Have a great day.